Hey guys, welcome to my show again. Today we have a very special guest with us and his name is Frank King. So he was the writer for the Tonight Show for over 20 years. He was a corporate comedian for over 30 years and he also did five TEDx talk. Plus he also worked with several famous people like Alan DeGeneres, Adam Sandler, Jerry Seinfeld and plenty more. Plus, we also have another video with him, and which is about how to lend a TEDx talk. So you better watch this video and that video too, right? Let's get into it. What dream would you pursue if you knew for a fact that you had absolutely nothing to lose? Yeah, spoiler alert, didn't pull the trigger. <laughs> yeah, I've got a friend of mine here named Glenn Friesman who came to see me as another speaker. When I said that, he heard me say that, he goes, how come you didn't pull the trigger? I said, Glenn, could you try to sound a little less disappointed? Is that <laughs> And something called chronic suicidality, which is little known, which means for me and people in my tribe, the option of suicide is always on the menu for problems large and small. A couple of years ago, my car broke down. I had three thoughts unbidden. One, I'd get it fixed. Two, I could buy a new one. Three, or I could just kill myself. It just bubbles up as an option all the time. Uh, today we have a very special guest on our show and there is, uh, there's going to be a hell of an intro actually. So his name is Frank King. And oh God. <laughs> <laughs> he, was a, uh, he was a writer for Jay Leno and Tonight Show for 20 years. He has been a speaker and corporate comedian for over 10 yeah. years and he was also featured on CNN's Business Unusual. Yep. He also holds a record for the longest non-stop comedy road trip ever. Well, he worked with some of the funniest famous people like Adam Sandler, Alan DeGeneres, Jerry Seinfeld, Kevin James and many more. Right. So later he became a public speaker about yep. suicide prevention, mental health, depression. He did five TEDx talk like the one, uh, you know, I love, you know, uh, uh, the laugh and the death one, especially, you know, a matter of laugh and death, actually. So as you can see, well, he has you. a lot of experiences to share with us, right? So hi, Frank, good to have you here on my show. I am delighted to be here. Uh, and yes, I actually just <laughs> got booked for my sixth TEDx talk. Oh, uh, so I'll, I'll be doing that in June. It's coming June, right? This year. Yes, uh, I believe the. Yes, I believe one of the organizers is from India. I do believe. Oh, that's wonderful, actually. So you know, uh, let's get start uh, with our show. Like, so Frank, how do you have? Actually, okay. You know, your journey have started. How to you, that you have make people aware of suicide, depression, or you know, mental health. Well, I started as a comedian. Uh, 1985, and then I did that for about um, 10 years, did, did 10 years. some radio, mm -hmm. then I jumped to the corporate comedy, which is, you know, after dinner, after lunch at a convention, mm -hmm. and then with the recession in 2010, we lost everything in a bankruptcy, and I learned what the barrel of my gun tasted like. Um, okay. Spoiler alert for your listeners, I did not pull the trigger. <laughs> I and then when the speaking business came back after that mm -hmm. the people who had booked me before said you know we love you we think you're very funny but you need to have something to teach us oh. and i thought what in the world do i have to teach and then i began to think about my mental health issues it runs in my family it's called generational depression and suicide mm -hmm. grandmother died by suicide my great aunt my mom i came close and so I thought I could I could speak on suicide prevention. So I got some training in suicide prevention mm -hmm. and I began to speak. And that's all I speak on these days is suicide prevention, uh, generally as a workplace health and safety issue or a college mm -hmm. health and safety issue. Three college students a day in the U.S. died by suicide. Oh, that's so a big problem. Anyway, that's how I got into it. And being a comedian, uh, it's easier to sit through that serious topic if you get a little laugh along the way yeah i think that that's really cool 
you know the fact is people don't uh, usually talk about depression or suicide uh, in my country or any other places around the world i guess well the awareness is very minimal if you see so what do you think we must change on our level of perception towards this you are doing what i would recommend um mostly i get paid to come in and start the conversation on suicide because what i discovered is even though many people don't talk about it if you bring it up if you mention the word suicide or depression out loud pretty much everyone has a story huh. and so i think i'm surprised you are doing a podcast in india on suicide because i have a friend okay. who's from that part of the world so her folks are from pakistan okay she did a tedx talk she mentioned in her tedx talk she had tried suicide three times and was living with schizoaffective disorder and her parents were furious because they said you know in our community we do not talk about those things being from pakistan i'm sure it's the same from india and 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 the middle east and in the us um, you know uh, native americans alaskan americans hispanics culturally that's not something that they talk about or talk about easily so it's you know it's a variety of cultures where it's you know it's not it's it's a last sort of verbal taboo we don't talk about that yeah Which i think it's right. really need to talk about that because there are other people out there mm -hmm. yeah i think it's right actually you know in uh, my country also there's several things i've seen like if you are not a big star if you're a big star then people will start noticing yeah he did suicide because of this reason that reason but uh, generally they don't have that awareness kind of thing uh, they don't want to talk about it even mm -hmm. your parents and your neighbors like in my country or the pakistan you say so i think you're right like yeah yeah it's a cultural thing and you know I, they they don't want to talk about it almost like it's contagious <laughs> you know the, if you get, if you talk about it you might catch it you know and um <laughs> but but again the interesting thing is once you mention it when i speak i tell my story i get a little choked up and it allows other people who hear me speak to give voice to their feelings and experiences without recrimination because there's a stigma attached to mental illness and there's another whole separate stigma attached to thoughts of suicide so exactly. people don't say anything about it because they don't want to be stigmatized <laughs> and men tend not to share their feelings regardless um eight out of ten people who die of suicide in the u.s are men oh my. and so it's yeah it's almost epidemic among men uh so you know research shows like the number of people because we're tough yeah <laughs> you know so, uh, the research sh shows that the number of people doing jobs or like entrepreneurs have, you know, societal thoughts or they are disturbed, mental health, this kind of thing. Like job issues, nine to five jobs, they can't do it. Like this creates a uh, lots of tension around and, you know, uh, it's a way up. The graph is way up, as I've seen in several articles or the research. So why yeah. does this actually happen, you know? Well, I think it's because it's, I don't I don't believe it's the mentally ill people who are suffering so much because we are used to waking up in an uncertain world every day. Okay. And if you're high functioning mentally ill, mm -hmm. you probably have a self-care plan and some other techniques to be able to get out of bed in the morning, put your feet on the floor. Okay. What you have with the pandemic is otherwise normal people who whose lives have been turned upside down. They have no structure to speak of, you know, uh, and so they may be situationally depressed but if you've never been depressed how would you know what it was i mean you may be wondering why do i feel this way how come i can't get out of bed well it may be situational depression you need to talk to somebody and ask them you know describe your symptoms and then find out if, if in fact it is you know depression and i would say if medication's indicated just figure it'll be short term until the pandemic eases up and then you can taper off uh, yeah, exactly. You know, also you said in one of your TED talk that many famous people, you know, have mental, you know, disorders, but they can't still they can still climb up the ladder to success, right? I'm curious what kind of connection they have, you know, between this uh, mental stability mm -hmm. and success, you know? Well, they, an article appeared in Inverse magazine this week on the web. Mm -hmm. And they've done some genetic research and it appears that the gene the genes for 
depression and the genes for intelligence overlap. Okay. So it may be that people with mental illness are actually more <laughs> smarter. But the reason I did the TED talk on, it's called Mental with Benefits, the evolutionary advantages of mental illness. As I looked around, like I said, I looked around and saw all these famous people who had a mental illness of one kind or another, but they were also famous. They were really good singers or dancers or comedians or, you know, um, politicians, athletes. And I thought this cannot be a coincidence. There must be some connection between the mental disability and the mental ability. And I came to the conclusion, although Ted doesn't agree, that I'm not broken. I was actually made this way. And I believe that my suicidality and depression are simply the flip side of my creativity, um, imagination, mm -hmm. comic ability. I can teach you to write stand up comedy. I can teach you to perform it. I cannot teach you to process the information coming in the way my, you know, my crazy brain does. So I think that's, that's the connection is, and you know what, um, they, there's a book called the bipolar advantage okay. and the one of the first people they profile is an American founding father named Alexander Hamilton. And they believe looking at historical reports of his work life, that he was in fact bipolar because he'd go for days writing and then crash and burn and then go for days writing and crash and burn. Okay. So it's been with us forever. It's just a matter of um, and he was very obviously talented, creative, okay. troubled. <laughs> So, you know, does failing in our life cause this kind of, you know, feeling in ourselves? Like, does failing causes this kind of thing? Mental disorder or something? If you're like, well, yeah, please. No, for me, it's just, it's hardwired. It's in my genetic, you know, it's in my genes uh, because it runs in my family. So mm -hmm. for me, it's rarely situational. I've been most depressed at some of the best times in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can be triggered by a situation like a pandemic or a bankruptcy or a you know, divorce. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of depression I have and many people have, it's, it's a cycle. It, it lasts anywhere from three days to three weeks and it recurs like a flat spot on a wheel, just comes back around. Mm -hmm. With therapy and medication, it comes around less often and it doesn't last quite as long, but it always comes back. And the benefit for someone my age, who's been living with this for decades, mm -hmm. I know when I start to slide, that it's about a three day cycle. So I know if I just hang on for 72 hours, all will be well. But if you are new to depression, mm -hmm. you tend to live in the immediate moment thinking life's never gonna get any better than this and that's, a lot of people don't understand that most of suicide is not about killing yourself so much as it is ending the pain. You just want the pain to stop and that's the only way you can figure out, you know, with substance abuse disorder, alcoholism, drug addiction, mm -hmm. same basic reason you're trying to kill the pain, but of course, short term with, with not quite so dire consequence. So, but yeah, it's all about pain and killing the pain. It's really hard to understand, you know, if you see someone having this kind of depression and mental uh, disability, you can't actually see them unless you have unless you start some conversation with them unless you have a connection with them because people won't say that kind of yes thing and they suffer inside inside them like you know it's really hard to get them uh well uh, what can we do one thing that yes. can help people around us facing the same issue what can the simple things we can do well if they mm -hmm. i would say you need you need to, if you're feeling depressed whether you have clinical depression or okay. whether it's situational to the pandemic, you need what we call a self-care plan. And okay. you have to control the things you can control. So my self-care plan is diet. I'm on the keto diet and I do intermittent fasting. Exercise, I've got some exercise equipment behind this green screen. Okay. Um, good night's sleep, mm -hmm. meditation. I meditate twice a day and medication if it's indicated. So those five things, that's my self-care plan. You also need to share your struggles with someone you know, love and trust or several someone so that they will be there for you and understand what's going on. If, you know, as I say in the racing business, if the wheels come off the car and they know they're not going to be taken completely by surprise mm -hmm. so they can, you know, they know they'll know how to help you at that point. Um, I would say if you are struggling and if you've not been diagnosed, mm -hmm. talk to a mental health professional, tell them your symptoms and see if in fact it's it is depression or, or something else. Could be something entirely different, but 
but I think you need an evaluation. And the thing about medication is this, the average medication for, let's say depression, okay. one third of the people, it works amazingly well. One third of the people, it works okay. And one third of the people it doesn't work at all. So that means two thirds of the people aren't really happy with their medication. You can now do a cheek swab DNA test. There's several companies online, four or five companies on, like, like ancestry.com, cheek swab, and they take your DNA and they compare it to a number of antidepressants and they find the one or two they think works best with your metabolism. So there's a lot less experimentation, you know, going on, doesn't work, taper off, going on, doesn't work, taper off. So that'd be my recommendation. And if, if it's someone you know, love, who is depressed, I believe you need to not say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, turn that frown upside down. You need to say, I'm here for you and I mean it. I know depression is a mental illness. The good news is with time and treatment, things will get better. I'll take the time, I'll help you get the treatment. Now here's the tough question. Yeah. You have to ask them just like this. Are you having thoughts of suicide? Now, if you can't ask that question, find somebody who can. Exactly. And there used to be a, an urban legend that you should never mention the S word suicide in front of somebody who's depressed because I love this. It would give them the idea. Yeah, like it never crossed my mind. So you have to ask them, are you depressed? I'm sorry, are you suicidal? Yeah. And if they say no, then how would you know? Well, here are a couple of signs. Okay. They uh, talk about death and dying frequently. You catch them Googling death and dying. Death and dying appears as a theme in their writing or artwork. They get getting their affairs in order. They're giving away prized possessions because they want to make sure they go to the people they want them to go to. Mm -hmm. And here's a dangerous one. They've been depressed for a long time and then are happy beyond measure for no apparent reason. They may be happy because they've chosen time, place, and method, and they know the pain is about to come to an end. But let's say they do admit to you they're suicidal, having thoughts. You say, do you have a plan? And if they have a plan, what is your plan? If it's detailed, you need to get them on the phone with whatever suicide prevention hotline they have mm -hmm. in your country. Okay. If the plan is not particularly well developed, my next question is, well, tell me, are you gonna kill yourself? And if they say no, this is the most important question, I think. No, they're not gonna kill themselves. Then you say, well, tell me why not? Yeah. Make them give voice to whatever's keeping them here. So that's, that's what I teach when I speak, is those things. Because here's the deal. Um, eight out of 10 people who are suicidal are ambivalent. They want somebody to notice and interrupt. And nine out of 10 who are suicidal give hints in the last week leading up to an attempt, meaning they want somebody to notice something and speak up. So that's why I teach this so that you can now recognize the signs and symptoms and step up and be persistent because anybody can stop a suicide. You don't have to be a clinician. It is the most preventable causes of death on the planet. So you can often do it, save a life by doing just what we're doing right here and starting a conversation. Yeah, exactly. A starting, just starting a conversation, you know, make uh, really good changes around, right? So I think you have really put some great, uh, you know, things around here that uh, will definitely help the viewers and in my country i hope this thing will slowly slowly be more uh, relative yeah. around yeah so i'm i'm yeah. trying to do this in a new way and i'm figuring out what can i do more so really thanks for your effort and all the saying you just said right oh yeah absolutely